Imagine if you would create for people in your company, a platform that would provide them with the same experience they have when working with AWS or Google Cloud or Azure or any other public cloud provider. Imagine if there would be a service for everything they do. Do you need a database that works exactly as we expect it to work in this company with all the security backup compliance and other policies we have? Well, there is a service for that. Do you need to run a backend application in Kubernetes? There is a service for that as well. Do you need a Kubernetes cluster itself? There is yet another service for that. All you have to do is define a simple manifest that contains only the things you care about and abstracts all the unavoidable complexity. From there on, all you have to do is submit that manifest, the desired state, to the control plane API and observe the actual state. Even better, you can forget about the API and just push it to Git. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be great if you could replicate the experience of using a public cloud provider but made specifically for our needs? Wouldn't it be amazing if there would be a clearly defined API and a clear separation between the tasks and users need to perform and the tasks that are responsibility of the platform itself? If that sounds like something you might need, then Crossplane is just the project that will get you there. It enables us with capabilities of creating control planes based on the same principles public cloud providers have. It democratizes technology that was previously reserved mostly for big cloud providers like AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. It enables us to create internal developer platforms. Let me give you a sneak peek into some of the capabilities we will build throughout this tutorial. Before I do that, I need to give you an early warning so that you can decide whether this tutorial is for you or not. I will not use a typical teaching approach where there is a long introduction followed by an even longer theory, followed by an explanation of each of the components, followed by a bunch of diagrams, and so on and so forth. This is a tutorial that reflects the way I learn. And I learn by doing. I learn by having my hands on the keyboard at all times. I learn by making mistakes and fixing them. I learn by experimenting. That's the approach I will take with this training. I will explain theory and concepts, and I will show diagrams, but only through hands-on exercises. I will explain what we did rather than what I explained. Does that make sense? If it does, you're in the right place. Otherwise, go away. Go away while you still can. With that warning out of the way, let's take a quick glimpse at some of the things we will build throughout this tutorial. That should give you a good idea of what you can expect and let you decide whether crossplane is something you want to learn and adopt. I lied. I lied when I said that we will take a quick glimpse at some of the things we will build throughout this tutorial. We will, I promise, but not right away. First, we need to create a control plane cluster with crossplane compositions, Argo CD, and a few other tools that will be required to show you what we are building. Now, to make things easy, instead of providing step-by-step -step setup instructions for this and all other chapters, I created scripts that will do that for us. You can run them and follow the instructions they present through questions, or you can choose to inspect the scripts if you prefer setting up everything manually. However, we have a bit of a problem. To run those setup scripts, as well as the instructions that follow in the hands-on parts of the training, we will need some tools. We will need quite a few CLIs, like for example, kubectl, crossplane, gum, gh, hyperscaler specific CLIs, and so on and so forth. One option would be for me to give you the instructions on how to install all the CLIs we need. That, however, might result in you spending considerable time reading those instructions and installing those CLIs. We will do something else. We will run everything in Nix. It allows us to create ad hoc shell environments with all the tools we might need. It's awesome and it will help you streamline this training and avoid complications that might arise from using different operating systems. If you're not familiar with Nix, you might want to check out that video or simply install it. Apart from Nix, we will need to install one more thing. I don't think we should run Docker in Nix, so we will need it on the host machine. You probably already have it. If you don't, please install it by following the instructions that are available 
somewhere there in the description or on a side, depending on whether you're watching or reading or whatever you're doing with this. It's available. Finally, we will need GH or GitHub CLI to fork the repository with the examples we will use throughout this tutorial, including shell.nix file that will bring in all the tools we will need. Please install it if you do not have it already. You can find additional information about GitHub CLI in that video. Finally, each chapter has an associated gist that contains all the commands we will execute. You can use it to copy and paste commands instead of pausing videos in an attempt to read what's on the screen and type the same in your terminal. The gist is in the description of this video. That's it. Now we are ready to set up everything required for me to show you a glimpse of the future. First, we will fork the repo, then enter the crossplane tutorial directory and select the fork as the default repository. Next, we are going to start a Nix shell with all the tools we will need in this chapter. Executing Nix shell with all the required packages might take a while since there are quite a few CLIs we will need to install. It takes longer the first time the packages it's downloading are cached, so subsequent executions will be almost instant. Be patient, it will be worth it. Once it's done, we will get the shell with everything everything we need. As an alternative, you can skip running Nix shell, but in that case, you will need to ensure that all the requirements are fulfilled. You will see what those are in a moment when we execute the setup script. Next, we will make the setup script executable and execute it. Confirm that you're ready to start unless you prefer to inspect the script and set up everything manually. Next, double check that you meet all the requirements. If you're running the script from inside a Nix shell, as I recommended, you do meet all the requirements, except for Docker. Nix took care of that. So if you do meet all the requirements, just say yes. Now, those configurations will ultimately create hundreds of custom resource definitions. That takes time. So expect to wait for a while until all the providers are up and running. Once all the providers are ready, we are presented with a choice of a hyperscaler. I will choose AWS for this chapter, and you can choose any of the big three, you know, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. To keep things interesting and for me not to be labeled as biased, I will pick a different one in each chapter. So the outputs you will see in this video might differ from those you will see in your terminal. The logic for all the providers is the same, so that should not pose a problem. As long as you're aware that what you see in this video might not be exactly the same as what you will see in your terminal, unless you happen to pick the same hyperscaler, which, as I mentioned, is AWS in this chapter. I assume that the downside of having a discrepancy between what you see in this video and what you will experience by potentially choosing a different hyperscaler is justified by you being able to pick a hyperscaler that best suits your needs or whichever you're used. Once the hyperscaler is selected, the script sets up everything required for Crossplane to work with it. Finally, the script installed and configured Argo CD. Throughout the execution of the script, a few environment variables were placed into the .env file. We will need those, so let's source it. That's it. Now we're ready to take a look at some of the features we might expect to learn throughout this training. Here's what the future looks like. There are around 50 lines of YAML, more or less. That might look intimidating, but once you see what that YAML creates, you will realize that it is infinitely simpler than if you try to accomplish the same result any other way. It starts with cluster claim that will create a Kubernetes cluster in your favorite hyperscaler. Which hyperscaler it will be depends on the match labors. In my case, it will be an AWS EKS cluster. Then there are a few parameters that specify that the nodes of the cluster should be small and that the minimum number of nodes should be three. I don't have to worry about exact node sizes. Crossplane will translate small to whatever that means in AWS or wherever you're running it. Please note that if you're using Google Cloud, min node count is set to one and not three because it will be a regional cluster running in three zones and GKE will create one in each. So there will be three in total. To make things more interesting, Cluster claim will only create a managed Kubernetes cluster, but also make it production ready by setting up Cilium, installing Crossplane, creating a few namespaces, and quite a few other things. Further on, we have a secret that contains the encoded password for the database. We will improve on that later when we integrate Crossplane with solutions for managing secrets. 
The third definition is SQL claim, which will create a managed PostgreSQL database in the hyperscaler of choice. But that's not all. Not only that a database server will be created, but a new user and a database will be created in that server as well. Finally, there is upclaim, which will run a backend application in the yet to be created cluster defined through cluster claim. That backend app will be automatically connected to the database defined through the SQL claim. In other words, those 50 or so lines of YAML will create a production-ready, managed Kubernetes cluster, a managed PostgreSQL database, and the backend application. Moreover, those three will be interconnected. The application will be running in that cluster and will be connected to the database. There are probably a few other things that will happen and we will comment on them later. Now, as you will see soon, creating all that often requires experience in AWS, Google, Azure, Kubernetes, databases, and quite a few other technologies. But as a user of cross-plane compositions, we don't need to worry about any of that. Right now, we are consumers of a service created by someone else. Now, you might expect me to execute a command that will make all that happen, but that's not what we'll do. Instead, we will treat it as the desired state and push it to Git where it belongs. So we will copy the manifest to the A team directory in the repo, which happens to be monitored by Argo CD, and add, commit, and push changes to the Git repo. That's it. That's the only action I will do, no, we will do in this chapter. That's all it takes. Now, please open Argo CD in a browser, use admin as the username and admin123 as the password and sign in. There is only one application managed by Argo CD. That's the one that monitors the A-team directory. To see the real action, I will enter into the application and lo and behold, those 50 or so lines of YAML expanded into quite a few resources. We can also observe what's going on by interacting directly with the control plane cluster through kubectl by retrieving cluster claims, SQL claims, and app claims. We can see that the cluster claim and SQL claim and app claim, the resources we defined in YAML are there. None of them are ready. It will take a bit of time until the Kubernetes cluster, the database, the application, everything in between are created and fully operational. Now, those three resources expanded in quite a few lower level resources, which we can observe by retrieving all managed resources. The output shows AWS resources and a few others. If you chose Google Cloud or Azure, your output will differ. In my case, I got AWS Internet Gateways, Route Table Associations, Main Route Table Associations, Routes, Route Table Associations, Route Tables, Security Group Rules, Security Groups, Subnets, VPCs, an add-on, a cluster out, a cluster, a node group, row policy attachments, rows, an RDS instance, and a subnet group. <sighs> oh. <sighs> Those are the AWS resources that Crosspen is managing. Further on, there are some Helm releases and Kubernetes objects that will be created in the control plane and the new cluster. Finally, there is a database that will be created in the managed database server. If you're using Google Cloud or Azure, the number of managed resources will be smaller. Nevertheless, no matter what you chose, it's clear that those 50 or so lines of YAML are very, very, very simple to define and understand when compared to everything they produce. An easier way to explore resources managed by Crossplane is through the Crossplane CLI. Among other features, it contains the trace command, which is, at the time of this recording, a better release. By the time you watch this, it might become GA, so you might need to remove beta from the command that follows. The output shows a tree-like structure of all the resources managed by the cluster claim resource, one of the resources we defined in YAML. We can see that cluster claim created the composite cluster, composite resource, which in turn created a bunch of managed resources will go through claims, composite resources, and managed resources later. What matters for now is that we can see what are all the resources that are managed by the cluster claim we defined earlier. Another important note is that some of those resources are synced while others are not. Some are ready and others are not. Unlike some other tools, resources managed by Crossplane are eventually consistent. Some cannot be synchronized because they miss some information from other resources, and some are not ready because their preconditions were not met, or they are in the process of being created. As you will see later, everything 
will be eventually consistent. We can observe a similar output if we trace the SQL claim, the second cross-plane resource we defined. The database server and everything else required to run the database are also not ready. It will be ready soon. Finally, we can trace the application itself defined as the up claim. It's normal that the application is not yet running. It should run on the new cluster, and until the cluster is created, there is no place for it to run. As with the other two, all I can say is that it will become eventually consistent. Here's what you should do next. Take a short break, get a coffee, pause this video. Once you're back, we can trace the SQL claim again. This time, all the resources required to run PostgreSQL are available. The managed database is up and running. Let's see what's going on with the cluster. All the resources required to run a cluster are up and running as well. That probably means that Crossplane could apply resources related to the backend application. It should run inside that cluster and it should be connected to the database. Since both of those are fully operational now, the application should be running as well. Let's check it out. Everything is up and running. Those three resources we defined at the beginning expanded into dozens of other resources. Some of them are resources in a hyperscaler, while others are resources in the new Kubernetes cluster, with a few others sprinkled for good taste. We are almost done. The last thing we will do is feed my paranoia. I need to confirm that everything is indeed working as expected. We will do that by entering into the newly created cluster and taking a peek to see whether the backend application is indeed running. And to do that, we will export the kubeconfig variable and retrieve the kubeconfig from the hyperscaler of choice. This is one of those cases when instructions differ depending on the hyperscaler you chose. You will find the instructions for your choice in the gist, and the gist is in the description. Now that the cluster config is set, we can check whether it indeed has three nodes I specified. The nodes are there. How about uh, the application? It should be running inside the production namespace, right? The application is indeed up and running, and it is connected to the PostgreSQL database. As I mentioned earlier, this was only a glimpse of some of the features Crossplane offers. There's much more to it, and I did not want to prolong this section more than necessary. The goal was not to teach you how to use Crossplane and all its nitty-gritty details. That's coming next. So far, the objective was for you to see some of the things it can do so that you can decide whether that's uh, something you might be interested in. I hope that the answer is a resounding yes. Crossplane is unique. It's special. It changes the way we manage resources of any kind. It enables us to create control planes. It enables us to do things that were, in the past, reserved for only a handful of companies. So, what do you say? Shall we continue? Each section starts with instructions on how to create everything needed for that section and ends with instructions on how to destroy everything we created. That way you can explore each section independently from others. You can take a break without having to run and pay for all the resources we created. I wanted to make it easy, but also cheap. No one should spend more time and more money than necessary. In that spirit, there are instructions on how to destroy everything we created in the gist. Just check it out, execute uh, two, three commands, and off you go. Everything is gone. Now, before you leave, there is one thing you should know. This is a series of videos. There is more than one. This is only the first one. And I will publish them every once in a while. I mean, probably once a week, something like that. Anyways, you will know that the next video is uh, published if you see it up somewhere over there. Uh, the link to the video or in the description, right? As soon as I publish, I will link it at the end of the video. You will see a thumbnail here or here, and it will be in the description. So you will know whether it's already published or you should wait for a while. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one. Remember, it's multi-part series.